Good evening. I'd like to welcome you tonight uh, to our executive lecture series. My name is Dave Herman. I'm the instructor for the course that this class is, uh, or this series is actually for, the 3550 class. So let me take care of a couple of housekeeping things before we start, and I'm going to turn some time over to uh, Mike Glauser, who's going to introduce our speakers tonight. Uh, for those of you in the 3550 course, I've put an email up on the board here. I've got several of you that weren't here last week. Uh, this is uh, Natalie Champlin's email. And uh, most of you asked, well, how do I get on the dinner schedule? Okay, so if you will look at the schedule of speakers and email Natalie your uh, top three evening choices of when you'd like to go, she'll get you in on that. Is that correct? Okay, so that's what you need to do. Now, for those of you uh, RCD students that are out in the way, if you'd like to make a trip up and attend one of these dinners and one of these lectures live, we will uh, give you preference uh, for seating at those tables, all right? But the same email, I, don't, I think the camera, I don't know if you can read that, but it's just natalie, L-E-E, -E, right? Dot champlin at usu.edu. So if you take, uh, take a minute and do that. Uh, the rest of you for the course, uh, uh, all the drop boxes are up. Um, you should be able to uh, find uh, tonight's lecture on the Dropbox. So when you're done writing your uh, report, uh, just submit it in there. And remember, you have one week. If you wait till next week at the same time, you've waited too long. So I get it in there in the one week time frame. All right, I'm going to, uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Yeah, that was an overzealous UTF that uh, figured he wanted you to write up something on me, and that was not a 20-minute information discussion. Okay, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Mike Lauser. He's our Director of Entrepreneurial Programs here at the Huntsman School, and he has been uh, the catalyst and the uh, driver behind this executive lecture series, and I think the man responsible for almost all the speakers that we have this semester. And he's going to introduce our first three speakers here tonight, and so I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Dave. Okay, welcome. It's great to have you here. How many of you have run in a Ragnar event? See the hands. Okay. How many of you know about Ragnar Relay? Ragnar Relay. Okay, just about everyone. We have a just a fabulous evening plan. Let me just say a couple things to get started. Uh, I am the executive director of entrepreneurship programs. Uh, but also the new director of the Center for Entrepreneurial Excellence, which will launch next week. So Wednesday, uh, at the same time, will be the opening of the center. We have a press conference at 3 o'clock in the lobby right behind here if you'd like to come. And then there's a large, uh, more of a, a larger dinner. Uh, people are coming to that by invitation. You can still email Natalie. I think there's some room at that dinner. And then at 7 o'clock, the speakers are uh, two USU graduates who... Uh, started the company iFrogs and just sold it to Zag recently. So that will be another great evening. Uh, our Center for Entrepreneurial Excellence was designed to really help students and community members uh, conceive, launch, and grow new companies. We have a whole host of resources. We have tools for assessing opportunities. We have branding services. We have uh, web design and programming. We have uh, funding sources. We have uh, just a variety of things, including mentoring to help people start and build new companies. And so we're very excited to launch that center here on the campus next week. We also, as a center, are responsible for curriculum in entrepreneurship. So we've just created and gotten approval for a brand new MBA. It's an MBA in enterprise development that will start in uh, August. And you basically take a new company through your MBA and work and build and launch your own business during your MBA studies. We've also just gotten approval for a minor in entrepreneurship for both business and non-business students. So if you're a non-business uh, major, you don't have to be accepted into the business school to do a whole minor in entrepreneurship and build a course and receive support along the way for that as well. Uh, this lecture series is one of the programs. We will have entrepreneurs on our campus every Wednesday, uh, really exciting, interesting entrepreneurs. And uh, they'll meet with students. Uh, you'll be able to meet them in an uh, <coughs> informal dinner setting. And then they'll be here to speak and answer questions. And so that will be every Wednesday, every year from January through April. And so this is our first year. This is our first annual series. And the Ragnar team, is, they're our first speakers. So we're thrilled to have them here tonight. Um, 
I think the Ragnar uh, organization was built on some of the keys that we teach here. It was built on passion. It was built on tenacity. It was built on great customer service. It was building, uh, meticulously building and protecting a brand. It's about contributing to the broader community. And as I think about it, I think of uh, several words. I, I would say Ragnar is about fitness, fun, friends, family, and memories. How'd they do? Pretty good? It's now the largest overnight relay series uh, in the world. 60,000 people participated in 2011. So this is just a, a huge success, an interesting hobby that's been turned into a very successful business. Uh, I talked to a woman that ran the Las Vegas Ragnar relay uh, last a month or so ago, and she said the event was one of the top 10 experiences of her life. And uh, you probably hear that occasionally. And she was running through the desert in Las Vegas in the middle of the night. And on her iPod, the song, uh, You Get What You Give by the New Radicals came up. And these were the words that she heard, and she started crying. And this, this was an incredible thing. And it describes, I think, I think it describes Ragnar. 4 a.m., we ran the Miracle Mile. We're flat broke, but we do it in style. First we run, then we laugh until we cry. So that can be your theme song, perhaps. So let me introduce these, uh, these incredible uh, business leaders here. We have Tanner Bell here, um, who is one of the co-founders of Ragnar. He received a, a degree in business information systems management from Brigham Young University. He worked for a time for PricewaterhouseCoopers. He founded Ragnar in 2004 with a great friend of his, Dan Hill. They had $2,500 and a ton of passion and tenacity, and that was probably about it. And then they figured it out and made it happen. Uh, Ken Jacklin is uh, one of the founding partners of Dolphin Capital. Dolphin made the uh, large investment into this company that allowed them to grow very rapidly and become the largest overnight relay series in the world. Uh, so Ken will speak next, and uh, Tanner will talk about how they started to build the company. Ken will talk a little bit about uh, why they invested in the company. And Chris, who will speak last, is the CEO of the company now. But Ken uh, lives in Park City. He received a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware and an MBA from Columbia Business School. He spent 10 years in investment banking with Alex Brown, Bankers Trust, uh, Deutsche Bank in Baltimore, London, and Tokyo. Uh, during this period of time, he closed over 60 advisory and capital markets transactions with an aggregate value of, in excess of $15 billion. So a very seasoned uh, investor, venture capitalist. Uh, Chris is also a partner with Dolphin, and he is now the CEO of Ragnar. He received his degree from Eastern uh, Connecticut State University. In his early career, he helped grow Mecca Software into a market-leading tax preparation software, which was ultimately sold to H&R Block in 1994. Chris then joined Home Financial Network right when it was formed and assisted in the growth and ultimate sale to Sybase. He went on to become the general manager of the newly formed web and wireless division of Financial Fusion. Before joining Ragnar, Chris spent five years as president uh, of Foundation Source, where he helped grow the business from $100 million to $3.5 billion in assets under management. Uh, so we're going to let these three uh, great leaders speak in that order. It will take about 45, 50 minutes. And then we have questions and answers right up until uh, 8.30. And then, of course, we have... Aggie ice cream afterwards right out in the lobby. Uh, those of you at remote locations other than Logan, when you have questions, uh, if you would leave your mics off the entire time during the lecture, and when you have a question, go ahead and turn on the mic and then introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and where you are, and that'll work great. Okay? So let's welcome uh, these three executives from Ragnar. All right. Does anybody see the irony in an endurance event and Aggie ice cream right after? <laughs> I mean, like, we should go for like a couple miles and then have Aggie ice cream, right? Um, uh, thanks for having us. We really appreciate the opportunity. We love, I love doing this. I think these guys love doing it. We've had the opportunity before at a couple other places. Um, so we're just going to sort of tell you what we think, give you some ideas, um, some advice from an entrepreneur perspective, uh, advice from the investor's perspective, how to... <laughs> Um, secure financing, what investors look for. Um, but I get to talk about the fun stuff, which is how we started, what we learned, the dumb mistakes we, we made, and the, and the, and the uh, passion that it takes to be an entrepreneur. So um, 
we're going to start with a little video. So I don't know if anyone back there can grab those lights. We're just going to start with this uh, video. This is a user-generated, runner-generated video from a team, the Never Nudes. I don't know if anybody knows the Never Nude reference. Um, somebody tell me, because I don't even remember exactly. It's a, that's right. It's Arrested Development. And he's got some, some deal, some disease where he never wants to be nude. I don't know. It's weird. So, um, and he like has an affinity for Smurfs. It's weird. So just watch this. You guys will enjoy it. <laughs> All right, we're going down now. Let's hear some noise. Three, two, one, go!
Yeah. Not sure what I did, but I did it. But I did it. <laughs> Excellent. See if this works. Oops. There we go. Excellent. Well, I think I'm <clears throat> safe in saying that I'm, we're probably the only guys in this whole long entrepreneur lecture series that are going to start out with Beastie Boys. So you're welcome <laughs> for that. Good way to start out, right? Can't complain. So this is a user-generated video. This is from one of our. This is from one of our teams, the Never Nudes. Um, but we get videos like this all the time. They're not quite always this awesome and and uh, this high of quality, but we get all these great videos. And it shows you what Ragnar is. Um, so Ragnar is a l much more than a race, but I'll tell you about the race specifics first. Um, who had run Ragnar before? Who's done Ragnar? All right. Tell me just real quick, shout out. What's your favorite part of the race? Any ideas? Any? Night run. You're done. <laughs> Sleep, right? My leg, I ran. Um, Ragnar is an overnight relay race. So it's generally about 200 miles, 12 people on a team, and each person runs three legs. Each leg is about between five, uh, three and eight miles. So you run uh, about 18 miles total. Okay? So it's a very doable format, or at least that's what we tell you, because we want everybody to run. Um, <laughs> So, and that was something that in the early days when we started it, we said, you know, we don't want this to just be exclusive. We want this to be a very inclusive brand. And so we, we talked about, even though this is a challenging event, how do we get people to do it? We, and we really, really focused on, let's make sure this is really inclusive. And it really is a very doable event. You just have to train, be reason, just get yourself in reasonably good shape and you can really fake it. Um, so it's 200 miles. Um, the amazing thing about it, it's just this, it's just this amazing, amazing format where 12 people get together, everybody runs one leg at night. Personally, my favorite, I ran Florida Keys like uh, two weeks ago. I was running down Alligator Alley um, on my way to Key West from Miami, running on this dirt road right next to a canal where all the, all the alligators hang out, just waiting to like, kick one in the head. And it's, it's sort of like this video depicts this controlled chaos. You know, it starts out and you're like so good on your race, right? You start up the start line, you got everything's all organized and you got your coolers all set out and you got your food and you know what you're going to do and you know what clothes you're going to wear and then like everything sort of falls apart throughout the rest of the race and then you just like don't know what to expect right it's like all of a sudden you can't find your shorts and you're running without underwear and you got to borrow somebody's shoes because you left them on the side of the road and that's like what Ragnar is about it's about coming together having an adventure having a wild time Standing on top of the van, clanking on your water bottle where you got, you know, jean shorts on. I mean, it's just crazy. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish. At the end of the day, we want you guys to just come and make it your own. Um, our brand is something that we want to be, like I said, very inclusive. And we want you guys to sort of create it as you, you know, create your own experience. Um, so I'm Tanner. I'm the co-founder. Uh, we started this thing in 2004. Um, so in 2004, this is what our website looked like. I kind of designed this with help. I'm an information systems major. What that means is that I had no idea what I was doing when I got out of college. And so I faked this. I had some guy that helped me, and I kind of maintained it, right? Um, so this is what our first website looked like. Originally, we were the Ragnar, or we were the Wasatch Back Relay. Uh, we, we started with, um, well, let me tell you where the idea came from first. Steve Hill um, is one of my partners. I'm going to move this table over. They can see me over here. Sorry, guys. It's in my eyes. Um, so in, in, uh, in 85, Steve Hill, uh, one of the original founders, he ran a race in Oregon called the Hood to Coast, the original relay race, just you know, same format as ours. He ran it. He loved it. He had kids, though, and he, he wanted to bring one to Utah, and he just couldn't. It just never really worked out for him. He had kids. He had a job. Uh, he was an attorney at the time, and he was probably too smart to realize. You know, He probably realized how much work it was. Um, and so he talked about it for years. And I grew up across the street from Steve and his son, Dan. And Dan and I have been great friends forever. We were roommates in college. And we were staring down the barrels of real jobs uh, when we were about to graduate. So I was going to uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, great accounting firm, had a great time there. He worked for a company, Bullfrog Spas. You guys probably heard of it. And about a year, year before we were about to graduate, 
uh, we said, why don't we try this little run? Steve Hill had been talking about forever. Um, we thought this would be really cool to do. We had no idea if it would be a, um, you know, if it would be like a business, if it would just be part time, if we just like do it a year and then stop. But we thought it would be fun, and we had the entrepreneur bug in our blood. Um, you know, he and I actually in college had started a volleyball team and then a volleyball retail business out of the basement, and we lost two thousand dollars of our dad's money. It was great. <laughs> so we already knew how to lose money, so we were good at that. So. Um, so we already sort of had that in our genes. We had put on a couple of volleyball tournaments. Um, so we, we tried to start where we decided to start this race. Um, our initial investment was not quite as sizable as Mike led you to believe. It was not 2,500 bucks, it was actually 1,000. Um, so we had no money starting this thing out. We basically, our marketing strategy was PR. It was just beg and plead, lie, seat, chill, whatever, lie, cheat, steal, whatever we need to do to get any sort of marketing, any PR that we could. Um, because we just couldn't pay for any advertising. Uh, my wife will tell you about stories of going to 5Ks and marathons and passing out really terribly designed flyers and just telling, you know, just really trying to explain to people because it was a new concept. Um, in fact, I remember our promotion one year or from one race was giving out popsicles, just sticky messes. And nobody really understood. All we got was like two year old or four year old kids, you know, nobody wanted to hear about the race. Um, so, but we, we, we worked hard and we talked to a lot of different people and one day I was driving home and I'm a big AM radio geek and I was listening to, some of you may remember, they, they still actually do it, I think Rob Bruff um, with Zions Bank does the, the speaking on business segments. Back in 2004 it was Fred Ball who did Fred Ball speaking on business and I thought we got to get ourselves there on that. We are, we're, we're with Zions Bank. And I didn't know how to do it, so I waited till about dinner time one night, and I looked up Fred in the phone book, right? And there were four Fred balls, so I just figured I'd call the first one. So I called the first one at about six, six thirty. His wife answered. Um, well, I presume it was his wife. And so I said, "Hey, is Fred there?" Like I knew him, and she suspiciously was like, "Yeah, let me grab him." So Fred answers the phone. Hey, this is Fred. I'm like, "Hey, is this the Fred Ball speaking on business?" And he said, yes. <laughs> um, and he knew there was something wrong at that point. So then, I, so then I launched into my pitch. I said, you know, we're this new race. It's so cool, 200 miles out. To this day, I have no idea if Fred is even a runner. So I pitched in this race about it. And he, you know, pretty skeptical. He said, well, you have to, that's really like a service. It's an advertisement a service for our Zion's Bank customers. Um, so, and I said, well, we're a customer. He said, yeah, but I need people that have been with us for like 10 or 20 years. All right, well, think about it. So I didn't hear from him for like two months. And then two months later, his secretary calls up out of the blue and says, hey, great news. Fred Ball is going to do the, a speaking on business segment with you guys. Um, I said, awesome. I hung up the phone and then realized that we had just switched a month earlier to Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> so I ran down to Wells Fargo and got all our money and put it in Zion's bank. <laughs> So it's that kind of stuff you have to do, right? I mean, it's just, like I said, beg, borrow, uh, beg, beg, borrow, cheat, and steal. Well, don't cheat and steal, but beg and borrow a lot. Um, but it's that kind of stuff that worked for us. We got 22 teams the first year, worked out to about 260 participants in the grand scheme of run, running events. It's nothing. Nobody even noticed we were coming through. I mean, we were running, I mean, it was so small that we really didn't even, like, our operational strategy was, we probably don't need permits, right? Um, I mean, they're public roads. It seems obvious to me at the time that uh, you don't need permits. And then about six weeks before, we're like, well, maybe we should double check because we are putting porta potties there. So we call it the DOT six weeks before. Hey, do we need a permit to put porta potty? Uh, they said, yeah, it takes about six weeks to get this done. I said, well, we'll fax this over today. In <laughs> um, so, but like I said, the inaugural participation was about 264 runners. So 2004, we took nothing out of the business. Frankly, we lost um, uh, the first year. As I said, um, that's yeah. So that's what our that's what our first website looked like. Um, interesting, right? Sort of your standard, sort of your uh, probably less than standard um, running event website. This is our first year. Uh, first race was up at Harbor Ranch. We started in Logan um, for a long time. Can you guys hear me okay? I don't know if this mic is picking me up. Okay. Um, so this is Hardware Ranch. This is uh, one of the first heats. Um, pretty awesome, exciting start line, right? Um, 
And, oh, I don't want to get there. Yeah, so 2006. Um, so then 2005, um, well, so 2004, let me tell you, what happened was it was this small group, 260 runners. Hardly anybody knew we even came through. But something special happened. Anybody here besides my mom run the first year? My mom's here. No, okay. There's only 264 of you. Um, so anybody that ran that year will tell you that something special happened that year. Like we got to the finish line and we all just kind of knew like this is going to be big. And Amy Donaldson, in fact, I'll go back. You see Amy Donaldson from the Deseret News has become a good friend of mine. She ran the very first year and this was her quote. This race is what I love about life and that it brings out the best of people. Sleep deprived and starving, we relied on each other without question. We were all just trying to navigate the course and looked to each other without even asking names and offered help without waiting for a thank you. It was the best experience I've had in sports since I was a little kid. Amy Donaldson is a sports writer, a very jaded sports writer. Now, she's a sports writer. Now, that meant a lot coming from Amy Donaldson. It was pretty cool. We all sort of had that experience at the finish line. The second year, uh, we tripled in size. I think we had somewhere around 80 teams. Big growth. We were really excited about that. Um, but still, 2000 and 2005, you know, it still was not enough for us to take a paycheck. We were working jobs. At that point, we had both graduated. We were working jobs um, and trying to put this on sort of nights and weekends. Um, in 2006, uh, 2006 we, um, we looked at sort of the competitive landscape and we realized 2006 we actually grew again. We, we I think, doubled in size to about 180, 190 teams. We realized that we had something. We realized that it wasn't just special that first year, that, that we really had a tiger by the tail. And we looked at the, at the landscape and there were only three or four other races out there doing what we did. Hood to Coast, the one that we basically got the idea from, and then three or four more. Really small sort of mom and pop shops. We said, we have a huge opportunity here to, be, to define a category, to change the world of endurance sports, and to define you know, a brand. So that it's not just called Relays, but it's called Ragnar. I, you know, I did a Ragnar. And today, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but today, oftentimes I, heard, I will hear people talking about other Relays and say, hey, did you do that Ragnar? So it's pretty cool. We saw that opportunity. And we knew that we needed to move quickly. There's a lot of other competitors in this space. There's Iron Man. Iron Man has grown phenomenally over the last 10 years. Uh, competitor group who owns Rock and Roll Marathon Series, Xterra Triathlon. Um, so we knew that we needed to move quickly. And we looked for financing, one of the typical challenges of, of, uh, of, a, um, of an entrepreneur, right? We were fortunate enough to find Dolphin Capital Group. We, we ran into Eric Jacobson, um, one of uh, Ken's partners, Ken and Chris's partners, and Eric happened to be an adventure racer. He was a guy that really understood and had a passion for events. He understood the endurance world. He had done you know, three and four day adventure races under the Go Light team, and he really had a passion for the space. And he saw what we were trying to do, and we were able to get an investment that allowed us to quit our real jobs. Um, so I actually worked for Pricewaterhouse for all of six months. So that was a really difficult time to quit, because. They put a lot of money into training me, and I, I quit. Um, but yeah, I know. It was terrible. I felt so bad. Um, in fact, the tangent, when I quit, my boss said, well, it's, I'm sure I'm supposed to talk you out of this, but it sounds like a really cool opportunity, so go for it. Um, so that was really fun. But um, So we quit our real jobs. We took 50% pay cut, literally, literally, dollars and cents, 50% pay cut. Um, at the time, we had no kids, and both of our wives uh, worked, so we got benefits through them. So technically, it was more than a 50% pay cut when you consider it insurance. Um, and I have to say that you know I was working for a prestigious accounting firm. It was you know my path forward for years and years, and I was going to be a partner. And you know I have to admit that my in-laws were kind of wondering if I was crazy. You know <laughs> I had a good job. I was pretty, you know, stable and sort of set up, and I took a 50% pay cut for what was a race. Um, you know, people still ask me today, so you can make a business out of that, right? Um, but it was a defining decision for us. Uh, we, had a, we had to make a decision at that point. Did we want to be a regional, you know, three, four, five race company? Or did we want to be the premier series of overnight relay races? And there's nothing wrong with either. We would be... It would be a different world for us, but I'm sure we would still be successful. I'm sure that we would have three or four races and we'd employ you know, three to five people, um, and we'd have a, a really great, cool business.
But we've had the opportunity to change the landscape and to establish a brand that people are tattooing on their bodies. Um, it's just been a phenomenal ride for us. Um, so what, what, what that did for us, uh, what, the, what the initial round of funding did for us was it allowed us, one, as I said, to be able to quit our real jobs, and two, it allowed us to go through a branding process. Uh, we were arguing about logos and um, <coughs> names and all these different things, so we started to go through a branding process. And this is our third website, a little bit of a muddled brand, you can see it. Uh, not really sure, I got this off of... Uh, the way back machine, so it wasn't as bad. The black squares were there, but you can see there's not a whole lot to this. We had a title sponsor, Zango, so our brand was secondary. There's nothing really to latch on to from a brand perspective. Um, so we hired a, a firm and went through what was supposed to be a two-month branding process um, to define our brand and to, and, to, and to come out with a logo concept and a, uh, and a brand blueprint. Um, six, six weeks, I'm sorry, six months later, six months, so, you know, it was supposed to take two and end up taking six. And we fought tooth and nail in a good way with our, um, with our marketing firm to create the brand that we wanted. We, we knew what we wanted. We just didn't know what we wanted. Does that make sense? We knew what we wanted and we could see it in our heads. We just didn't know exactly what it looked like. This is actually the first version of, of what we came up with in Ragnar, right? So Ragnar, we, we came up with the brand name, but we still didn't have a logo that we wanted. Um, these were actually called at the time, we just called them doohickeys because we didn't know what they were. <laughs> and it was a crown, you know. So we fought a lot. We, we really worked hard with our marketing firm to get what we wanted. Um, eventually, we came up with this. And, and this, actually, we were so frustrated at one point that we actually left our marketing firm and went to a different firm. Uh, we went to a, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, a company called Logo, is it Logo Concepts? Anyway, they made 25 logos for us. We took one, took it back to our firm, and said, this is what we want. <laughs> what we found out is Ragnar is a 9th century Norse king. Um, I'll read that to you in a little bit, but it's basically a double R, front and back, and then it's also a warrior mask. And a lot of females tell us that it looks like a butterfly, which is fine with me. Do whatever you want, as long as you run. <laughs> Just run. So Ragnar was a 9th century Norse king. Uh, he was a pirate, a conqueror, a wanderer, a wild man, and a charmer. The tough, fearless, free-spirited and social attributes of Norse king are shared by recent Ragnars as well. In much the same way, the Ragnar Relay brand conveys the freedom to roam, <laughs> to explore, to lead, to be free-spirited, uh, I'm sorry, a free-spirited desire to get out there and experience an outdoor adventure with friends, and maybe even to conquer. When you think of Ragnar, we want you to think of a mix of Butch Cassidy, Jack Sparrow, William Walls, and Amelia Earhart. <laughs> Pretty good, right? Maybe the Beastie Boys, too. So this is where you see our brand today. That focus and attention to the brand and to, 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 um, to owning that category has turned into some really amazing things for us. You see the brand in facial hair. You see the brand in shirts and logos. You see the brand on our vehicles. You see the brand in whatever this lady is doing. Um, she sent us this picture. I don't know what she's doing. Um, but probably... The most, uh, the thing that we're the proudest of is that there's, I don't know, I don't know that we have a count, but at least over 25 people that actually have Ragnar tattooed um, on their body somewhere. Real, legitimate, permanent, <laughs> makes me nervous if we ever do anything wrong, tattoos on their body. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's, it's incredible. I mean, think about, think about another brand out there that actually inspires so much confidence and so much passion and, and is such a memorable experience that somebody actually wants to tattoo it on their body. This one's incredible because it's not just Ragnar, but the, the, uh, the palm tree is for Florida and I think the moon and stars are for Vegas, I can't remember. But so every race he runs, he does a little logo around that, um, around, around our logo. Uh, the only other endurance series that I know of and as far as this much passion and confidence is the Iron Man, the MDOT logo. So I'm sure you guys have seen that somewhere around. Um, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, and that passion and tenacity for knowing what we wanted and not saying, and not letting, you know, our marketing firm bulldoze over us was really important. Sorry, I'm going too fast. I've got to catch up with myself. Um, so this is who we are today. Um, in 2012, this is what our website looks like, a far cry from where we were before. 
it bespeaks the brand, right? You see, you know, William Wallace in here. You see Amelia Earhart. You see these crazy, wild people, and it gives them one night and one day of just this wild, crazy adventure to get out and to, to roam free and enjoy themselves. Um, this is what our finish lines look like, a far cry from our start lines that I showed you before, right? This is Park City. Um, just a massive gathering of over 14,000 people. Today we have 60,000 participants nationwide from 220 only seven years ago. To give you a perspective, the Hood to Coast, the Hood to Coast, the race that we, um, that we basically copied, um, started in 85, and I believe it took them almost, what, 20, 15 years to get to 1,000 teams? I think it was about 15 years to get to 1,000 teams. We did it in seven, and we launched 15 other relays. Um, so this is what we look like today. And you can see the brand in here too. You can see the orange. You can see the logo front and center. You can see the chariot of sweetness. That's the band right in the middle. Um, so everything is, you know, everything bespeaks the brand. The run, drive, seek, repeat tagline. It's all about who we are and about inspiring passion and confidence in our runners. So like I said, today we have 15 races around the nation. I think this actually only shows 13. We've got Colorado and a few more. Um, it's been pretty phenomenal growth. Um, so why have we, oh yeah, why have we been successful? I'll leave it on this slide. I don't want you guys to have to look at words because who wants to read words on PowerPoint? Um, so why have we been successful? There's a lot of reasons why, but I think uh, there's a few keys for me personally. Um, hopefully these are good takeaways for you. One, um, we've had the courage to be who we are. Uh, I asked my wife if I looked okay today. She said, you should probably wear, wear a collar shirt. I said, nope, not going to happen. That's just who we are, right? We have the courage and passion to be who we are, to be sort of the hippie race director runner, um, to go into sponsorship meetings with guys that, that wear suits and just show up like this because we want them to know that this is who we are and that this is why your sponsorship is going to be valuable. And because the people that here running that ran had an experience with a brand about this wild and crazy overnight adventure, experience with this wild conquering pirate, and I didn't want to show up with a tie because it wouldn't fit the brand, right? Um, so the next one, we, we've been tenacious about finding the right partners. Uh, we partnered with people and we pulled those people close that have supported us and take us under our wing. Um, people like Dolphin Capital, people like um, Active.com, one of the you know, biggest registration spaces out there. Um, people like Amy Donaldson with the Deseret News, KSL, um, Nordic Track is the one I wanted to mention here since we're in Logan. Those guys have been our our presenting sponsor for at least five years now, and they, they help us along the way. We help them. It's been an amazing partnership. Um, as I mentioned, I don't need to go into this too much, but our brand, we just we are just animals about our brand. We call each other out. If we're doing something wrong, whether it's a founder or whether it's you know the, the receptionist, we tell each other if we're off on the brand and we make sure uh, that, that we are being true to ourselves and true to our participants. Uh, we take care of our top performers. Um, we make sure that they have opportunities. It's not always the easiest thing. We're a small company. We're growing. And so we don't know exactly what the next opportunity is going to be. But we take care of those people and we're loyal to them. Um, and then, as I said, loyal. we're loyal to our runners and to our sponsors. Um, so I'll, I'll end with some advice for entrepreneurs. Um, my advice for you. Couple things, couple takeaways. There's never ever a good time to start a business. I sat in one thing like this eight years ago, an entrepreneur lecture series at BYU. And the guy said, you should get a job first, live in the real world, and then start a business. And my perspective is you're flat out wrong. There's never ever a good time to start a business. It's all about finding the opportunity and running with it. And you may go for five years without finding the right opportunity. The other day, my brother sent me an idea for a business. I said, bro, I love that you're thinking about it, but this is not the right one. And so he's digging in school, and he's looking for jobs, and he's going to live that life until the opportunity comes up. But there's no magic like, okay, once I you know, work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, then I work five years and become a manager, and then I can start a business. It just, you just have to take it when you have the opportunity. Um, everyone can tell you why it won't work. Only you know, uh, only you know why it will. Everybody will tell you why it won't work. And, and there's very few Eric Jacobsons out there, um, you know, our, our principal investor. There's very few of those guys that will come and say, I get it, rock and roll. In fact, I ran into an investor the other day that said, I can't believe you actually got money to fund yourself. She's like, I believe in it now because it's successful, but if you had come to me seven years ago, I wouldn't have touched your deal. Um, 
You must be passionate about the company. I talked a lot about passion. Uh, be prepared for sacrifice, long hours, and hard work. Um, have a discussion if you're married um, or planning to get married. You need to understand the sacrifices that are going into it and both agree together on what those sacrifices are going to be. Um, and then find a mentor. Create a board. Soak up knowledge. I don't care if the, I don't, doesn't matter if the board member is, you know, your next door neighbor. Just have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of. It's better if, you know, it's somebody that really has some good experience, but you need somebody, a mentor, that can be passionate about your project with you and can call you out when you're making mistakes. Um, that's all I have. I don't want to go too long today um, because we really want to just answer questions. So I'm going to turn the time over to Ken, but appreciate you letting me talk to you for a few minutes. Okay, so Tanner got to, uh, to start with that video, and I talked with Mike about what I should start with. I didn't think Barbarians at the Gate would be that inspiring. So I thought I'd just kind of jump into it. Um, so I'm a partner with Dolphin Capital. We are uh, an investment firm, and what we do is we invest in businesses and in people like Tanner. And what I thought I'd do is I'd talk a little bit about, a lot of people think they know what venture capital is, they think they know what private equity is. I sometimes think I know what it is. I thought I'd talk a little bit about different sources of funding um, and how the private equity world lays out so you guys have a sense of that um, and how we look at businesses and then um, why we invested in, in Ragnar, which I think you saw a huge component of it uh, for the last 20 minutes. So, so this is how um, uh, kind of the world works in terms of investing. If you're, if you're trying to raise capital, there are different ways that you can raise capital. You can raise equity privately, or you can raise capital privately, um, which is you go and you negotiate it one-on-one -on -one with somebody like me or with a bank or a similar entity. Or you can raise it in the public markets. You can go public. Everybody hears about the public offerings. That's the public markets. And at that point, you open yourself up to the world. And then the kinds of capital that you can raise are basically either uh, you can raise debt or you can raise equity. Um, the big difference is debt, you, know, you have to pay interest on it, and you've got to pay it back. Equity, you know, people expect to earn a lot more of their money, um, uh, but you don't necessarily have that thread hanging over you of um, having to pay somebody back or something like that. So within this world, there's all kinds of different transactions, but those are basically the different, um, the different types of capital that there are. Um, and then within the world of private equity, there's a bunch of different kinds of capital, and I'll, I'll kind of go through them. Um, so the first, uh, you know, the first thing is friends and family. Tends to be very small. People who are pretty close to you. You know, when uh, when Dan and Tanner got five thousand dollars from Steve Hill, which was their second round of capital, you know, that would fall into the friends and family capital. Um, the problem with that is that five thousand dollars, or depending on who it is, you know, doesn't go very far. If if you're a huntsman, maybe it goes a little bit further. Um, but for most of us, it doesn't quite go that far. Um, next level is uh, a group called angel investors, and there are a lot of angel investors groups around. There are um, three main ones in Utah, um, and these are groups of people who band together to <coughs> invest in early stage companies. And usually they're kind of you know less than a million dollars. They'll invest in something that's very early stage. Um, they want equity, and you know the capital. There's a lot of capital out there like that. After that, you have venture capital. And this is where, um, you know, in between this angel world and venture capital world, for a lot of companies, it's where it's really difficult to raise capital. For somebody like Tanner, it's difficult to find where you fit. After you've tapped out, you know, your father and your next door neighbor and everybody else, um, it's difficult to get to this venture world where you need more significant capital, capital because they look for certain types of businesses um, where they can generate a 10x or 100x return. You know, while Ragnar is a great business, it doesn't necessarily have that potential. So a lot of businesses have trouble raising capital there. After that, you know, you can raise, you know, there are growth equity firms that you can raise five to fifty million dollars or more. And then finally, you know, leveraged buyout firms, you know, you can raise, you know, from you know ten million dollars to you know several billion dollars in that world. Different types of capital. Um, and then some of the firms are people who would do this. You know, so friends and family, it could be your mom. Um, could be your next door neighbor, um, and hopefully you've got a rich uncle. You know, it's just people that you know who would do that. Um, angel investors, those are some of the angel firms that are out there. 
in the venture world, there are firms like you know, uh, NEA has $10 billion under management. Kleiner Perkins, probably the most famous venture capital firm in the world, has I think $14 billion under management. There are really big venture capital firms that are, and even the smaller firms are looking for you know, the next Google or the next Facebook to invest in. Um, within growth equity, these are firms that probably most people would not hear of because um, they're not as splashy as, say, you know, the venture capital firms or the leveraged buyout mm -hmm. firms. Um, but that's when companies are looking to raise really substantial capital to go to firms like TA Associates or Summit Partners. They tend to put larger amounts of capital to work and look for companies that are profitable that are really looking to accelerate their growth. And then last is leveraged buyout firms. And, you know, KKR is probably the most famous from Barbarians at the Gate fame. Um, Blackstone is a company that's got $60 billion under management today. Um, Huntsman Gay is, uh, is you know, the most locally associated firm. I think they raised a billion dollars in their last fund. So what those firms will do typically is they will look to buy a very, very established company with a lot of cash flow, put a lot of the leverage on it, and then make returns through financial leverage. Um, what do people look for within these, um, within these businesses? Angels really look for two things, in my view, primarily. Number one, they really want a killer concept. They want something that you know, is unique and different, you know, <coughs> has a lot of growth potential. And then they really want to make sure that it has the potential to attract ongoing funding. Because they're looking for something that will grow very fast. When businesses grow very fast, they tend to use a lot of capital. So if you're an angel group that has a million dollars to invest in the company, you invest in a company that's growing like gang gangbusters, but needs you know, $5 million, and all of a sudden you run through your million dollars, you're in a lot of trouble. So they want firms that you know, have that ability to continue attracting um, capital. Venture firms, they want very, very high rates of growth. You know, I mean, Ragnar has experienced you know, tremendous growth. It's gone from 250 runners, you know, and each runner pays about $100, to 60,000 runners over the last seven years. You know, even that level of growth, you know, to a venture firm is not that interesting because they want things that will go from, you know, from, you know, $500,000 or no revenue to $100 million in five years. They want extraordinary, extraordinary rates of growth. Um, they want something that's very scalable, can grow rapidly. They always want an experienced management team, uh, that, you know, preferably a team that has been working in the space before and done it before. Uh, they want a leading technology, you know, they want to pick the next, you know, semiconductor chip, or the next, you know, uh, you know, drug that's going to be kind of a world beater, um, and they want a, you know, a big vision. And then from a buyout firm perspective, again, what they what they want to do is they want to put a lot of debt on the company, so they tend to look for very stable cash flows. And as Tanner would probably say, Ragnar as an example is an example of not very stable cash flows. Um, but you know, they want very stable cash flows because if they're going to finance the company with a lot of debt, they've got to be able to pay that debt back. Um, they look for undervalued assets. They look for heavy barriers to entry. They also, everybody looks for management too. Um, so a tiny bit about Dolphin Capital. We, we, like every private equity firm in the world, say that we're different than all the other private equity firms in the world. Um, so, but there are some things that are a little bit different about us. Um, we look to put one to ten million dollars in capital to work in businesses. Um, we think that we fall in a spot where a lot of other firms actually don't like to invest because they, have, they generally want to put a lot. We're above the angel level, yet below the venture capital or leverage buyout level. So there's a lot less firms looking to put that amount of capital to work that we are. We like businesses with high growth potential. Um, that doesn't mean a business that you know. I mean, we love businesses that could go from a million dollars to a hundred million dollars in revenue. But um, you know, we don't need those kind of returns. We'd rather have a more stable business, but still a business that could grow 40 to 50 percent or even more per year. Um, we are scared to death of technology risk, which if anybody went on our websites and looked at our partners, they'd find very humorous because Chris and the three other partners in the firm um, all um, had great success building technology businesses. Um, and so because they did so well doing that, we decided the last thing we want to do is invest in businesses with technology. Risk. We want to make sure that we can understand it. Um, we like scalable models. Um, if you look at some of our companies, and Ragnar is a great example, 
you know, they had this race called the Wasatch Back, which was doing really well and growing. We looked at it and we said, gee, if you can do that in Utah, which is the 48th largest metropolitan MSA in the country, you could probably do it in other places. You know, so we were bright enough that we could figure that out, um, but we can't figure out technology. We don't like financial leverage. We don't like the idea of putting a lot of debt on a company because it really restricts the business. Um, and generally, having um, really high growth and high leverage is a really, really bad mix. Um, and if you want an example of that, there was a company called Webvan uh, in the early 2000s that tried to combine the two of them. It was probably the worst ever explosion of the dot-com period. Um, and the last thing, and I think this is something that actually probably really does differentiate us, is passion. Um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people would have invested in Dan and Tanner. I mean, they were incredibly passionate about what they did. Um, the business is 100% about passion. Um, and, uh, and to us, that's really important. I think a lot of other firms, you know, are more maybe spreadsheet oriented and less, you know, focused on, boy, if these people are this passionate about it, then they are really going to build something. It may not be exactly what we all anticipate, but they're going to build something because passion will breed success. So that's something that we look for. So our businesses, just to talk through them, um, Winder Farms, how many here are familiar with Winder? Um, so Winder uh, is in a business that we first invested in in 2004. Um, uh, at the time, uh, the company's view was they had 600 cows and they needed somewhere to sell the milk. And our view was they had you know, 40 trucks that we could put a lot of stuff on it, we could attract a lot of customers. Since we've invested in it, we basically doubled the customer base We've doubled the revenue per customer, and we've really grown the business and kind of transformed the business. C to Ski is a property management company uh, based up in uh, Park City, uh, which manages people's second homes. It's kind of a completely different uh, take on property management, where um, the typical property manager is you have a rental property, you want to rent it out, they'll rent it out for you, it'll take half of it. C to Ski's view was if you have a $2 million second home, which a lot of people have in Park City, you know, and you spend 20 days a year there, you probably don't want to spend all your time managing it and dealing with groceries and dealing with contractors. So we'll manage it for you. And so it was a very different take on this business. And what's amazing, you know, they lose, you know, about a client every two years. Because if you have that much money and you can invest in a second home, the last thing you want to do is create issues for that second home. Um, we've invested in the Brine Shrimp Cooperative, which is a pretty fascinating business that harvests brine shrimp off the Great Salt Lake and sells it all over the world. Um, Dynamic Confections, which is a chocolate company, and you guys are unlucky because I forgot to bring uh, chocolate. But for those of you um, uh, I'm remembering, whoever told me to remember this, in two weeks we're going to kick off a Launch the Lollipop um, uh, contest among four universities. And um, Dynamic has three businesses, two chocolate business and a business that makes very highly customized lollipops. And this customized lollipop business is to the level where my daughter's fifth birthday, we gave out little lollipops that had a picture of her on the front of it, edible, and happy birthday Morgan on the back. So we're trying to think about how we can take that to a mass market, these very highly customized lollipops. Um, there's going to be a competition between teams from here, um, uh, University of Utah, Westminster, and what's that other school down in Provo? Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's going to be a competition among the different teams, and uh, we hope Utah State wins that. Um, Mike, do you remember the date that kicks off? The 26th. Okay. The, uh, um, so the 26th, and we hope we can get some teams for that. Foundation Source manages uh, private foundation, and then Ragnar. So, you know, lastly, you know, what we saw on Ragnar, um, we saw this scalable model. We saw barriers to entry. A lot of people say, well, how much in barriers to entry can you have in a business like this? Our view looking at this world is in, in every market, there's sort of one major running event, one major marathon, one major triathlon. And this had the opportunity to be the major event in every market. And once we get in, we can establish that as a significant barrier to entry. Um, it was, as Tanner said, an opportunity to totally create a category. Uh, one of the things he didn't say is they went from um, a market share which was not even discernible on a chart in 2004, to 60% market share in this category over the past, of course, the last seven years. And that's basically because they've built the category. 
Um, incredibly, incredibly talented and passionate entrepreneurs. Um, you know, it was two college students at the time that we first got to know them. And, um, you know, we just saw really, really talented people who were really, really passionate and loved what they were doing. And, and for us, you know, frankly, there was an element that it was a lot of fun to be involved with. So we got involved in it from, in it from that perspective. So that's my uh, private equity overview. Next time I'll come with a better video. <laughs> How's that? Good? Good? Everybody? Okay. So we'll bring you back to Ragnar. If you remember, i uh, make sure my fly is up. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll rem remember um, <clears throat> Ken are talking about where they were and where they were going and capital and so forth. And uh, enter the guy with not just one collar, but two. Um, so what happened is, you guys heard about my background. Um, what you didn't hear was that in my career, I've entered into companies uh, in two other situations in addition to Ragnar. I've entered into companies where an entrepreneur or a founder has got a business to a spot. And this spot, they're at this spot where they realize change is afoot and something needs to happen. And in, in, all, in, the, in all those cases, I've been fortunate enough to work with really talented people and come in and be the guy who gets it, helps get it from... 10 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. Pick your numbers, whatever the scale may be. One of the things that I always find that's pretty amazing is the pure passion and abject courage that exists among entrepreneurs. Uh, it's really hard to get things started. It's easy to tear them. As Tanner said, it's easy to tear it down. It's easy to say, oh, that's not going to work. It is incredibly hard. And the people I've worked with have had such passion and such courage to step forward and, and say, no, this can work, and here's why. And they're willing to fail and fail again and fail again until they get it right. Uh, and so that has been consistent in all of my experiences. Uh, the other thing that i found that has been very consistent is that the problems are all the same. Companies at certain stages go through the exact same problem over and over and over again. And the benefit of bringing a guy like me in who's seen those problems 15 times is we try not to make those same mistakes over and over. Now, I'm going to give you a presentation, which isn't up here. I'm just going to talk to you and tell you how to do it right. I promise you, half of those Ken's going to go, and you didn't do that one this time. You didn't do that one this time. But, you know, we'll, we, we try to at least drink some of our own Kool-Aid in the process. Um, so, so as I said, the, the problems are, 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 very similar, are very similar. And um, the other thing that might be interesting is you could look at it and say, geez, kind of intimidating, right? I mean. These guys started the company. They, they must know more than me. And that could be, that could be, kind of, that could be intimidating. And I'll tell you probably the first time it was. Um, but at the same time, you're there. And you're there for a reason. And if you're there, you're there because you've got something to bring to the table. Now, I'll flip it around because probably most of you guys here are sitting here saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the entrepreneur in the room. If you're the entrepreneur in the room and you get to that point and that stage, um, Realize that, yeah, you started the company, but you don't know it all. And there are a lot of people out there that can help you. You just have to figure out which the right partners are and make sure that they fit with you. Um, and, but the successful entrepreneurs are the ones who know where and when to ask for help. Um, so, I'll talk, so, so that gives you kind of just a little bit of a setup. As, I, as I've gone into these companies, and let's talk about it, I'm a little bit different, but let's talk about it as, as your company is starting to change, and you're either being pulled to growth, or you're looking out to growth, or you're thinking about what it is you're trying to do, there are some kind of key tenets that I want to keep in mind, especially when I get started in a new business. Now, the first one is, especially with, with, with entrepreneurial companies, you want to know the history. You want to know, you want to see those pictures of where this whole thing came from. And you want to know and you want to hear about all the crazy stories of how you know, there was no, no money and no, no power and they were, they, they were selling their own clothing. And you want to know all that. But at the same time, you don't want to try to relive history. 
You need, you need to figure out what it is that was special. What is that secret sauce that is delivering the success? And I promise you, it's not everything. In fact, it's probably one or two things. And, and the struggle is trying to And if you, if you, as you're going from, from small entrepreneurial company to scalable platform business that's going to create high enterprise value and serve the world, you just can't do it all. You have to, have to figure out what that special something is. The second thing is, is, is at this stage where you're going from small entrepreneurial startup to a scalable business, you need to understand that you're moving from a time where you needed to do everything, because you were the only guy, to figuring out what you're good at and where do you need help and getting those roles filled. Uh, you've got to trust in those people around you. But know who you are. I was I benefited by the fact that when I came to the Ragnar, these guys knew who they were. They knew what they wanted, and I, I, I got the experience. I caught the bug, and it was easy. It was easy to mesh. But as founders or as entrepreneurs, when you bring people in, you want them to fit what your ethos is. You want them to fit your belief system, and then you want to trust in them. And the, and the analogy it's, it's a little cliche, but it's really important. You want to make sure you still want to make sure you're holding people accountable and that they're doing their jobs because you don't want to just then turn away um, but the, the example I give is you know if you play football and you're in a position you're playing linebacker and the safety's not doing his job and you drop back to cover cover his receiver you've now just left the running game wide open your, your job is in the huddle grind by the face mask and say god you got to get on this guy you got to handle this or we got to do something to change that's that's the process, but you've got to trust in those around you, because to get your business to grow, you're not going to do it alone, and it's a, it's a mind shift, because you did the whole thing alone, and now you've got to shift to something a little bit different. And then the last kind of tenet that I want to keep in mind is the business is more important than any one person or person in the entire company. You, if you think that way, and you drive that that way and you believe that way, you will build an incredibly solid business that can outlast you and all those who come. Uh, and that's also a good little thing to have in your mind, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're trying to build a business, or whether you're just working at a company. It makes decision making incredibly easy when you, you put that first before yourself and anything else. It, it just makes the process go very smoothly. So those are just a, kind of a few touch points. Um, now I'll just take you through a little bit about kind of what I see at these stages in, in the business. So you realize now you've got something. You've gone from 22 teams to, to 80 teams. This thing is real. It's cool. All of a sudden, you start seeing stickers on every car on the highway. You launch another race. It's kind of like, wow, this is pretty amazing. And you say, OK, what now? What next? Uh, the fortunate thing is these guys were really clear on what they wanted. But I can't tell you how often I hear someone say to me, oh, you're the CEO of you do, you, you guys should create a bike relay. I think, oh, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Or you should go into half marathons. You guys would be so good at half marathons. And our reaction is, yeah, but we're an overnight running relay company. And we haven't even begun to be so much more to go. And so focus is absolutely your friend. So when you get to that phase of it's starting to happen, what, what you're supposed to do is sell. Sell, sell, sell. Maintain excellence, but sell. You want to figure out how to sell your product to six billion people, or your available target market, whichever is a little bit more achievable. But you want to get, you want to sell this product. You forget about the shed the distraction. 
Because they're, they're, how often, Tan, I mean, how often do we get distractions? We could be doing 15 different things. Here's an example. When, I, we, when we were four years ago, we were growing pretty well. And people would come from the finish line with literally with a credit card in their hand. They'd say, where do I get my souvenirs? And we, you know, at the time, it was maybe a few t-shirts. And, we, and it, was, it was like, well, we should, we should go heavily in the merchandise. Somebody said we should actually bring our, our clothing into stores because the, the brand is so strong. And our reaction was, well, yeah, except that we still have, there's, a, there's 10 million people in the country that pay to run a, run a race. There's a, there's a million people who run, run half marathons. There's 500,000 that run uh, marathons. And 170,000 people have run a ragnar. We've got a long way to go just doing that. And if we do that and do that really well and own it and drive it, and be true to that, selling merchandise is just going to be, you know, flip the switch. Now, that's not to say we ignore it, because if you've been to our races, we've got a nice tent, we've got a lot of things going on, but it's not our distraction. It's, a core, it's, not, it's not our core business. Our core business is serving our runners and creating the best overnight running realized in the country, if not the world. Um, so, as I say, avoid those distractions and figure out how to sell. Now, to sell it, and to sell it in a scalable fashion, you've got to figure out what it is you're selling. Um, what's, the, you know, what's the sense of curing cancer if you can only do it one time? Can you, can you, I guess one person gets to be really happy. But, 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 but really what you've got to do is you've got to figure out, can you replicate? What is it about what you do? That what is the secret sauce? And we talk about the secret sauce at Ragnar all the time. And there's a couple little secret sauces. Um, but, but what is it that you do that is so special, and can you replicate it? And if so, how are you going to replicate it? Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit difficult, because entrepreneurs, by nature, are wildly creative, wildly optimistic, incredible, incredible courage, and can get bored with the same old thing. But the reality is that's what you need right now. As a business, what you need to do is you need to figure out how to process this thing so that you can get it out to the world. And what we've had the benefit of doing is we've got a great partnership where you maintain the core of what, what you have in your, in your entrepreneurial brand partner, um, but bring process to the, to the table. And, and so in that, you want to, again, I, I can't say it enough, focus on your core competencies. Tear away and shred away all the distractions. And for Ragnar, I think we've gotten to a place where we are pretty clear what we have to do to make sure that what has been created, every time we bring it out to someone else, we maintain that core brand uh, and deliver that experience. Um, the last thing is, and, and this is the one that Ken might say uh, I didn't do so well, is resist the temptation to spend money. There's this, there's this, <laughs> there's this, I think we have a capital call coming up, by the way. Um, I think uh, there's a temptation when you're kind of, you get in the, that you got to kind of build the whole store. Ken mentioned Webvan, and that's a, you know they built a multi-billion-dollar infrastructure before they even went to went to market. Resist that temptation. You don't need that. What you need right now is sales. And then once you have sales, you can put the infrastructure behind it. It's easy to get infrastructure. It's hard to get sales. So resist that temptation is a common problem. The first thing you need to do is go spend money. You, you really don't. And Tanner is proof of that. Um, one other piece of the puzzle I think is really important is. You've got to force this process. So now, if you're, if you're the entrepreneur and you want your business to grow and you want to take it to the next level, you have to force process. And it's hard because you've come from a place where process was almost a four-letter word. As Tanner, you know, d d you know, no ties. Well, you know what? You, you need process right now because you're going to bring races that, that house 10,000 people that cover 200 miles to 15 different states and 45 different counties with tractor trailers and so on and so forth, if you don't have process, you're going to die. It is not going to work. And what happens with the process is, you know, an example was, you saw the picture of the start line. What happened would be, you know, we launched four races, and you go to each start line, you know, and one time the, the, the chute was here, and then another time the chute was there, and the porta potties were over here, and it basically depended on who, who showed up. If Tanner was there, it was set up one way. If I was there, it was set up another way. And at first, that was like, well, that, that's part of the creativity. Well, you know what? It really isn't. That's part of waste. What was really, well, and what we do now, and this was driven by all of us, was we lay out a site plan before we show up. And 
everybody, there's a requirements and, and everything is set out and thought through, traffic is thought through, where are the volumes gonna be, where are the queues, all that minutia. That isn't all that exciting, but it's what makes the business hum. And, and now what happens is I like to say, when you first come into a business like me or when, when you come in as an entrepreneur and you start to change and say process is important, I like to say, they, first they swear at you and then they swear by you. And the reality is that's what happens. Once process kicks in, people start to go, oh, I can't have enough of it. I just can't get enough of it, it's so good. It's like converting over to a computer system. The new, getting to the new system is painful, once you're there, you can't, you can't realize how you live without it. Um, and then the last piece I'd say is it's really important to have fun. Um, it's so easy to get caught up in what all the stuff I'm talking about. And it's really important to have fun and, and, and maintain some level of, of uh, enjoyment of what you're doing. And so some things we do at Ragnar that, that are really helpful. First of all, every, every Monday morning we do a standing meeting. And it's a 10 minute meeting and it's standing at 10 and we stand. And we stand so no one gets too comfortable because no one wants to waste too much time in the meeting. But that's a chance for us to celebrate our successes and tell people what's going on. Communication is an important piece. Um, we, we, instead of doing a Christmas party, we go skiing. Um, instead of going to the gym, we go play ultimate frisbee or I should say he goes play ultimate frisbee. It, there are things that, that you do that are just enjoyable and if you can figure out how to do something you enjoy and do it with people you like, your life gets a lot easier. It all just starts to mesh together. That's, that's the important story there. Um, remember always to have fun all the, way, all the way along. Try not to take yourself too seriously because it's just a job. It's just a business. It's not, it's not the entire world. Your family's the entire world. Um, last piece, uh, I'll just recap. So as I went through, you guys will probably ask this question. There's some, there's some secret sauce at Ragnar, and I, and I can't tell you it because it's under lock and key, um, but there's a few, a few things about it. Um, we've, we've created a very inclusive brand. It's a family. Uh, and one of the best stories I've heard was uh, one of our participants was a woman, got stuck on the side of the road with a flat tire. She's trying to get her tire changed. A car pulls up. It's a gentleman. It's getting late. She's nervous. She's thinking, hmm, who is this guy? She sees a Ragnar sticker, and she said, Wow, he's, he's one of the family. And all of a sudden, it kind of just changed. There was some collaboration there. Um, we've got this incredibly inclusive brand. And we put on incredibly high quality events at iconic locations. Um, and what happens is people go and they build their own experience. And because we've set up the stage for it, the brand gets all the credit. And it all comes together in this one fantastic experience called Ragnar. So that's all I have for you guys, hopefully that was helpful, and I don't know who I turn it over to. We have time for questions. There we go. Uh, forgot your questions. Sponsors early on. Sponsors. Sponsors early on. Um, you know, quickly. So what we did for sponsorship, this actually answered two questions at once. Um, what we did for sponsorship was we, we had found a good partner in a charity called Operation Kids. And we started to talk to them about our sponsorship needs. Um, because they were good partners, because we took care of them, kept them close, they actually suggested that we go talk to uh, that they actually brought somebody in that helped them with sponsorship and fundraising. And it turned out to be a guy named Don Sterling who had sold sponsorship for NBA, PGA, LPGA, uh, the Olympics. Um, he's now working for Mitt Romney on his campaign. Um, and so he helped us really devise our strategy, which is one of, um, which is basically at the end of the day, it's about finding out what they need 
So we never go into a sponsorship pitch and say, hey, this is, this is, uh, this is the package we want to give you. We go in and learn about their company, let them tell us what they're looking for, and then we bring back a package based on what their needs and objectives are. Because I can't, we can't, you just can't bring them a package that's going to, um, and that, that'll tell them everything they need. They'll just think you don't know what you're talking about. So, and then what was the middle one? And starting with them. Friends, friend, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's both challenging and um, rewarding. Um, I, think it's, I think it's challenging because for obvious reasons. You have to hold each other accountable. Um, you have to have knockdown, drag out fights when it's appropriate. Um, but you know, you get to build. You get to build something incredible and, and like share in this amazing experience together. So it's just, it's. Um, it, it, there's no doubt. It's certainly a challenge, but it's it's also been incredible for us to be able to share in the success that we've been able to create. So yeah, and and we get to like travel all over to cool places together. So that's not bad too. Last year we did like a bike relay. We actually did bikes and did a relay in one of our events, which no one else is allowed to do, so don't ask. Um, and, uh, you know, and got to experience this thing in the Florida Keys, so it's pretty cool. Your mentor question, surround yourself with people that you, um, they will find you, you will find them. Be out there. Uh, don't, be, don't, be, don't be afraid to talk and ask questions and get involved. Um, but I've had fortunate, I've been fortunate enough to have more than one in my life. And it's all happened through just being out there and having an affinity, just like you make a friend on a basketball court. Um, you said that people entrepreneurs know when and where to ask for help. Um, yes. Do you have any suggestions on guidance with that? Like, is there any books? Is there any you think that the. You know, Tanner, I, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd turn to you. I mean, there was a point where you guys said, okay, right? It's time. Yeah. Um, I think entrepreneurs will likely go through, if you're kind of going from a startup, you go through one or two, you find your life getting so crazy that you can't keep up, um, or you find things are starting to break apart. Um, so there can be negative reasons why you see that happen. Um, I think in the case of Ragnar, these guys had a vision, and they said, you know, they recognized that it was bigger than just them that was going to get it done. But yeah, I mean, I, same thing. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure all of you have read Good to Great, um, but you know, you look at Good to Great, you look at a level five leader, and um, and I think that one of the things that I took away, I haven't read it for years now, but one of the things that stuck out to me about Good to Great was that the great companies are led by people that are forgotten about when they leave. Um, so, you know, the Coca was a rock star in the '90s. I think it was the '90s, right? Um, and then he left, and then Chrysler's where it is today, and it was all about Lee Iacocca. Um, and I think that you can get caught up in that as an entrepreneur. It's your company, it's your baby, it's your thing. At the end of the day, like I, I want to have a legacy that isn't about me, but is about um, isn't about me and about what I created, but, but about this thing that sort of we created together in Utah, and then it went out to the nation and eventually the world. Um, so for me, that's what it was about. For me, I think was was shifting from not being about me and being about this great company. And I hope that, you know, in, in 100 years, people are talking about Ragnar, and if people are talking about Ragnar, that's what I want. Oh. Earlier you showed a map with all the different locations that you have the Ragnar. Do you have an idea of how many, how many states you want to have Ragnar in? You got an idea? How many, do you, how many, how many states are like, what, what's your vision? Utah has got what pulls the 49th, 48th largest NSA. So theoretically, we could have 50, right? Um, we've uh, we are currently routing uh, 10 new routes. Whether we launch them next year or over the next five years, we're not sure, but they'll be on the shelf ready to go. Um, and there's also an international component, uh, which is something that we haven't, for for want of focus. We haven't gone there yet, but easily, easily 25, possibly 50 is, you know, in that range would be what I think the country could support. Probably 100. <laughs> it's hard to know until we get there. I mean, but it, it's interesting because we thought at one point we thought that there, Dan and I thought there could only be seven, re, 10 relays in the nation. There were already three. So we were thinking maybe we could do seven. Um, so a paradigm has changed, right? That was part of building our brand and 
making the audacious statement that we would be the premier series of relay races. And as we started to go, we started to see more and more. So we have them on the shelf, but it's a process of, um, it's a process of uh, you know, a couple of things. But understanding the market, you know, cannibalization is sort of a concern, but you know, the, the, the saying that if you don't cannibalize yourself, no, somebody else will um, is very real for us. So those are a couple of ideas. Over here. So... So I, I t there's no great time. disagree. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I totally agree with him that there's no great time. I I mean, uh, on one hand, you know when Tanner did it, it's the best time, right? Because if you've got a job that's you know paying a hundred thousand dollars a year, and you've got three kids, and you've got a mortgage, and you've got a dog, and you know probably guinea pigs and everything, it's really hard. You know the stress on your, your life becomes a lot harder than. You know, not that it wasn't hard for Turner and Kristen, you know, at, as they were just, you know, starting married life. But I think when you have all these things that you're tied into, you know, you just, you've got so much more to lose, right? And yet, on the other hand, you know, they didn't have, you know, you know a knowledge base and experience level, all those things. And frankly, a knowledge base and experience level and all those things, you know, I think give you a lot more reasons to say no than to say yes. <laughs> Um, so, so I don't think there's a great time. I, I, I actually think, I always said, you know, for me, I'd love to be an entrepreneur, but I don't have the idea, <laughs> right? And um, I think the, the, you know, the worst time is when you don't have an idea, and the best time is when you do have an idea. And if you can get behind that idea, you go for it. Yeah, it's incredibly big. Um, so we have our our format's a little bit different than most races. Um, so our volunteers, we actually require teams to provide three volunteers as a condition of participation. So it's a little bit different than a marathon where they're talking to civic groups and cities and you know high schools, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it's basically run. You know, we have a staff of between 15 and 20 um, 20 people out. Um, and, and even a lot of those are what we call SWAT members, sweaty, wet, and tired team um, that comes out. We fly them out from all over the nation. So if you're interested in that, shoot me an email, let me know. Uh, but it's people that we trust that we fly out all around uh, and they get experience and put on Ragnars. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, we, we couldn't do it without the volunteers. It's a, it's a pretty, amazing, um, pretty amazing thing to see all those people come out and help out. The question is, why did we lose what we had in the first two years? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Somebody else mentioned that. They saw that picture the other day. Um, Nike was a sponsor because Dan's uncle was the vice president of footwear merchandising. Um, and <laughs> so that's basically how it worked. We talked to uncle, and uncle hooked us up with somebody, and they, I think, you know, it's easy. At that time, it was easy because 265 shirts doesn't cost that much, 14,000 shirts. Costs a lot more. Ask Nordic Track, for example. Um, so yeah, and, you know, Nike doesn't. Um, so that it was just sort of a small, like it was sort of an uncle favor thing. It lasted for about two years and then sort of petered out. Um, it didn't really make sense for them, and I don't blame them at the time, right? Well, I, I wonder if they're kicking themselves now, but Dan's uncle probably paid for the shirt. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'll probably pay for the shirt to have his own pocket. <laughs> uh, one more question.
Store in airports all across the country. I'm curious about your idea now. I think I know what it is, because I have the same idea. <laughs> yeah, so Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you clearly don't talk to him. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard because a lot of uh, you know uh, a lot of Dalton Capitals would you know you'd call and you have no you know you, I mean we get probably fifty calls a day on our answering machine and we return three of them right and a lot of them are you just have no idea and so what you've got to do which is what I think. Dan and Tanner were great at, you've got to be pretty tenacious about it. And you've got to, you, know, you want to get the Dolphin Capital. So you say, oh, who was that guy who was at the lecture? I can't remember. Um, and he was kind of sandwiched between the two really interesting guys. <laughs> I'll ask Mike, um, and I'll get an introduction. And, and so it is, it's really kind of...